Hello and welcome to our ninth Focus Dance Festival on mobility, which we're opening tonight with a set of three uh, quite short uh, inputs, talks by our guests, Dr. Mimi Scheller, Tevan Dicke Joseph, and Michael Turinski, who will each invite us into their perspectives on mobility and mobilization. I'm very happy to be here on stage with Tevan Dicke and Luise, and um, Luise is my co-moderator for tonight. And on screen, we will um, meet um, Mimi Scheller and Michael Turinski. So this is a hybrid event uh, streamed live in Zoom. Hello also to our digital audience. I'm very happy that you're with us. Um, our digital operator Mirko is there to help with any technical issues that might come up. Um, just uh, type a message in the chat. And this event is taking place in English, spoken language and is translated live to German spoken language by our two amazing interpreters, Miriam Sojinu and Jill Richter. Translation is available here in the room via headphones. You can pick them up at the entry. And in the Zoom, you can choose the German translation by clicking on the small globe symbol down below in the Zoom window and by selecting your language. Also, wenn jemand eine deutsche Übersetzung benötigt, können Sie sich die Kopfhörer hier in der Halle am Eingang holen im Zoom bitte einfach auf dieses kleine Globe-Symbol, Globe dieses Weltsymbol klicken und die deutsche Sprache auswählen. Um, my name is Alina Buchberger. I work here um, as a curator at Kampnagel. My pronouns that I use are she, her. And I co-curated this festival together with Luise Merz and Melanie Zimmermann, who is sitting in the first row. And um, yeah, I'm a white queer woman with chin, long brown hair and a streak of blonde. On the left side, wearing big glasses and a pink shirt and black pants with sneakers. I'm uh, visually describing myself for blinded visually impaired audience members and I'm now handing over the mic to Luise. Hello, I'm Luise Merz. Um, I also work in the dramaturgy team here at Kampnagel. I use the pronouns she, her. I'm uh, wearing all black today and having a red lipstick. Um, we will now listen first to the three um, impulses of our speakers here and afterwards we have an open discussions where you can um, yeah, question uh, some things to our speakers but we also prepared some uh, to have an open discussion afterwards. Um, the idea is that we are first having um, the three impulses of our speakers after one another. We will start with Dr. Mimi Scheller and uh, this will like takes about 45 minutes and so if you have any questions already please keep them in mind for 45 minutes and uh, we are hoping to have a nice conversation with you all yeah the first input as i already mentioned is from dr mimi scheller and will help us to get an idea of the broad range of topics attached to mobility studies and mobility justice and i will first introduce you now Mimi Scheller, PhD, is the inaugural Dean of the Global School of Rochester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. She was the founding co-director of the Center of Mobility Research at Lancaster University in England in 2003, and then became professor and head of the sociology department at Drexel University in Philadelphia, where she also directed the Center for Mobility Research and Policy. She was the founding co-director editor of the journal Mobilities and past president of the International Association for the History of Transport, Traffic and Mobility. Scheller is considered as key theorist in critical mobility research and published a large number of articles and books which are dealing with this topic. In her book Mobility Justice, the Politics of Movement in an Age of Extremes, published in 2018, Scheller reveals the intersections and unequal power relations of mobilities and impressively highlights why mobility justice is one of the crucial political and ethical issues of our day. We are really happy to have you here, Mimi, and um, yeah, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Luisa, and thank you, Alina, Melanie, um, the curators, and for all the team in the background who are, are bringing this event together. I'm really happy to be able to join you today uh, from 
Worcester, where I am in Massachusetts. So I want to introduce some of the topics of mobility's research as a field of study. And the I have a brief talk, and it's titled Immobile, with a sort of slash between the immobile and the mobile, choreographies, dance movement and mobility justice. And it was really the opportunity of this event that is getting me to really think about um, dance in relation to mobilities. Before I begin, I should say, my pronouns are she, her, and um, I am a, a white cisgender woman, and um, I have shoulder length brown hair. I'm wearing a black wool sweater because it's very snowy here today um, and uh, and have some grays coming in <laughs> in my part. So all around the world, people and governments are grappling with a series of crises related to how we move. The entire world faces the urgent question of how to make the transition to more environmentally sustainable mobilities, but also more socially just mobilities. That begins from the scale of what we eat, how we get around and, and move through cities and uh, other places, but also how we produce energy, how we circulate people and materials all around the world. Mobility justice is one of the crucial political and ethical issues of our day. It focuses attention on the politics of unequal capabilities for movement, but really unequal environments for shaping how we move and unequal rights to stay or to dwell in place. Thinking with mobility justice allows us to ask questions about the intertwined relations between bodies, streets, transport systems, buildings, urban systems, transnational infrastructure, national borders, and wider planetary mobilities. Mobility justice reveals the relation between all of the crises we live through today, the urban crisis of sustainability, the migration crises we see at our borders, the climate crisis, which is affecting all of us. The first point I want to make is that mobilities and immobilities are always connected. They're relational. They're codependent. Mobility studies as a field considers both demobilization and remobilization, slowness alongside acceleration, blockages and stoppages, friction as much as liquidity, and circulation along with coerced movement as much as freedom of movement. So we should always think mobility, immobility together, not as binary opposites, but as dynamic constellations of multiple scales from the body to the world, simultaneous practices of moving and pausing and relational meanings around who and what is moving or staying still. So all these scales that I've talked about, we can think of as a social construction as human geographers argue, and it is movement that makes and remakes space-time and entangles different scales as we experience them. Second, I wanna suggest that we think about mobility practices as a kind of choreography, a choreography through which various kinds of relations are assembled, stabilized, moved, made and unmade, involving both us as human actors, but also non-human actors, material things, um, material processes in ongoing combinations. Mobilities concern not just moving from point A to point B, but also all of these combined practices, these lived experiences, representations, and meanings that are attached to such movements. Mobile meanings are the ways that we make sense of and tell stories about the particular space-time contexts that we make, that we transform and inhabit through our ongoing lived immobilities and mobilities. Even human reproduction, to give just one example of thinking across scales, is a case of multiple mobilities, from the coupling of our bodies to the movement and mobilities of eggs and sperm, to the technologies of assisted reproduction that today move these biological couplings around the world 
where we see the movement of surrogates, of doctors and nurses and labs and documents and forms of legal citizenship and regulation. As practices of reproduction become no mobile in new ways, so too do its meanings shift. Thirdly then, the question of mobility justice is not just about what we call um, transportation justice, that is access to transportation within cities, although that's an important part of it. It's also about these smaller, almost nano mobilities within our cells, beginning with things like mobile viruses or bacteria or immunizations, and then the micro mobilities at our bodily scale, which is always inflected by racialized and classed processes, by gendered and sexual practices, and by the shaping of uh, disabilities and sexualities. It is also about the rights to transnational cross-border mobilities, the movements of refugees and migrants and asylum seekers, as well as the mobilities of tourists, travelers, workers, students, nomadic professionals, and kinetic elites. And it is, it is about the extended urban systems and infrastructure spaces that shape larger macro mobilities at the transnational and planetary scale, such as access to water and food and the circulations of energy and fossil fuel through pipelines and cables. So mobility justice considers all of these scales, how large scale systems such as automobility, urbanization, resource extraction, are linked to embodied power relations locally and globally. And it includes things like the expropriation of land, ecological destruction, which leads to eviction, expulsion, displacement, and the migration flows that are driving people um, to, to move to cities in the first place. These human mobilities at the global scale are linked to more local mobility injustices, such as racial segregation, and racialized displacement, problems of eviction, homelessness, and also mass imprisonment, especially here in the United States where I am. Lack of access to mobility is experienced by the elderly, by children, by disabled people, and by the poor. And the normative policing of everyday bodily movements affects women, queer people, transgender people especially. So the concept of mobility justice puts all of these concerns in conversation with each other, transcending separate approaches, but certainly building on the combined insights of movements that have taken place for transport justice, racial justice, migrant justice, sexual justice, disability justice, and climate justice. So that was a sort of opening overview of the many kinds of mobilities that I like to think with. Um, I have a, another, section I would like to address about thinking about choreographies more specifically. And let me just ask our, our curators, do you want me to go right into that or do we want, want to open the conversation to the others first? Yeah, please just continue. And then, yeah, I think after that, we'll hear Tivan Dicke. Okay, so okay. thank you. So I just um, took this opportunity to think about how can dance help us think through all the ways in which people experience movement and stillness as we move together in space and enact relational practices in motion? Built environments, streets, borders, walls, and cities impair some kinds of movement while enabling others. And this creates unjust mobility regimes that leave many people unable to determine their own movements or their own places of dwelling. People too are excluded from theorizing, designing and building their own environments and often have to make great efforts to be able to do that. So in thinking about the work of choreographers like those we will meet today, Mikhail Torinsky and Tabandeke Joseph, I hope that we will hear more about how they help us open up new ways of theorizing and practicing choreographies through forms of dance that question the power relations that shape mobilities and immobilities in relation to embodied perceptions and experiences of race, gender, space, ability, and aesthetics. I also want to acknowledge how the field of critical disability studies draws attention 
not only to the varied forms of inaccessibility that are built into our cities, our streets, and our transportation systems, but also are built into our beliefs about normative human mobilities. There are assumptions about good mobility, healthy activity, what is deemed normal. And these assumptions can limit and constrain diverse kinds of bodily mobilities and movement. The privileged mobile subject is understood as the self-enabled autonomous individual mover, often depicted as young, male, bourgeois, white, and able to walk. Geographer Rob Imri has argued that assumptions of unrestricted movement and mobility in contemporary Western societies are hegemonic in prioritizing specific bodies and modes of mobility and movement. So gender, age, race, sexuality, disability, and nationality interact in intersectional ways to restrict the movements of so many, and in many ways to have built environments and social norms that tend to prevent some people from self-determining their own movement. Beyond expanding accessibility in built environments as they are currently structured, we also need to understand the ways in which we can deconstruct or challenge the uneven mobilities that produce differentially enabled or disabled subjects and differentially enabling or disabling spaces. We need what I call a kinopolitical lens to understand this production of spaces and subjects that are interdependent both locally and globally. Mobility justice, we could think of as designing or choreographing movements for all kinds of bodies. This has entailed broad social movements to demand more inclusive mobility systems and spaces, but also to question the assumptions about impairment that are built into philosophies of the healthy body, the good city, the strong nation, or the natural environment. I believe that dance can help sensitize us to these normative assumptions and begin the difficult effort of unmaking mobility injustices. So certain kinds of deprioritized mobilities are a kind of social and spatial violence, often dehumanizing those whose movements are stigmatized and devalued. Critical disability scholar Laurence Parent, for example, argues that little is known about what it means to move through cities using a wheelchair. Dance can help us to better think with disabilities and with multiple modalities and meanings of movement. What does it mean to walk, to wheel, to crutch, to tap, to sense, to crawl, to hop our way through space in differential ways? And what can this tell us also about those who are migrants, for example, who are forced to move in different ways across dangerous oceans or deserts, seeking ways around deadly border walls and deportation policies. As mobility scholar Kim Sawchuk argues, the term differential mobility is germane for thinking of how some movement repertoires give preference to bodily norms that create hierarchies of corporeal differences that are structured into the built environment. Some people, she writes, may find themselves distanced from the quote, able-bodied and excluded from the world that does not allow them to move through with any ease. And finally, architectural historian David Gisson argues that the architecture of disability and more widely the practice of disability is not simply about overcoming impairments or improving accessibility, but it is, he writes, about promoting both an architecture of disability and a future practice of disability that aims to change the world. Although the fight for accessibility is an important part of political movements that have been promoted by people living with disabilities, these struggles go beyond access alone to question underlying ideas about functionalism, about physiology, about so-called incapacities. Political struggles by disabled people, Gisson writes, include not just the demand for access, but also a critique of the structural roots of debilitation, the geographical unevenness of impairment, 
and the potential intersecting stigmas of disability relative to gender and race. And so disability activism involves critical understanding of various kinds of labor and property and opens up a deeper context to engage with human subjectivity and rights, as well as perhaps extending our thinking to the more than human rights of nature as well. And so in conclusion, my hope is that performing choreographies that we might think of as disabling, that is that undo environments of privileged abling, these disabling choreographies can also help us critique our own assumptions about mobility, debility, stigma, and impairment, which intersect with our ideas of sex, race, class, age, and so on. Dance can problematize the normative places, economies, and labors of movement and show us new ways to move and dwell in common, commoning mobilities. Dance, I hope, can challenge us in critical ways to ask how can we all thrive, live, move, and exist together? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, dear Mimi. Um, I just want to add one more group to um, the enumeration you just did about uh, people that um, are concerned by thoughts about mobility globally. And I think one group of people um, that is very dear to us here at Kamnagel are transnationally working artists um, who are often struggling and experiencing um, border violence in various ways. Um, so I just want to point out that, uh, yeah, we would uh, ask for international art production to actually um, allow us to work internationally by bringing down these um, visa invitation, um, um, yeah, unlogical processes that as a German publicly funded um, institution, we invite artists and then other public uh, German um, administration just invite, uninvite these artists that we have just invited because we appreciate the artistic work. And so, yeah, this visa struggle really needs to stop if we want to actually uh, transnationally produce art. So I'm really, really happy to welcome Tebandeke Joseph here with us, um, um, who also didn't have the easiest way getting here. Um, so, um, yeah. I'm really, really honored that you are here with us, uh, traveled all the way. And um, I will introduce you um, briefly before I give the mic to you. Um, yeah, Tevandika Joseph is a Ugandan dancer, choreographer, and a former athlete, creator of platforms for inclusion and a workshop facilitator. He has worked in different locations, such as the Freiburg Contact Improvisation Festival, the East Africa Nights of Tolerance in Rwanda, the Tutsine Festival where human rights dance in Uganda, um, the Ubumuntu Arts Festival Rwanda and Segu Art Mali. Tibandike has created several productions with Kanduku Dance Company from the UK, Splash Dance Company in, based in Uganda, Mambia Dance Company and Pamoja Dance Company both from Kenya. Tibandeke also runs free workshops in his local communities once a week to promote inclusion in dance. And he has facilitated very recently a workshop at last year's Moving Margins uh, Symposium by ETE in Berlin. So thank you so much for being with us. I'm handing the word to you for the second impulse of this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy and delighted to be at this festival today, to be here with you all. Um, I will go a little bit off my script, but um, I'll start by saying, uh, I'll give you a little background about my work so that you understand why do I do the things I do, why do I think the way I think. Um, growing up as a disabled child, so many things didn't make sense to me when I was growing up because I, I, I grew up in a very small town that had really less, less understanding about the disabilities. And um, as I was growing up, I came to understand that uh, 
something wasn't right. The way people used to look at me on streets and how they could take my family. So after school, I discovered dance. And uh, this totally changed my perspective about what is happening in the world. You know, as I was growing up, there, there was, I used to see a lot of issues happening. People with disabilities complaining, uh, putting a lot of challenges. And I was relaxed. I thought by the time I grow up, things will have changed, you know, because people were making a lot of noise. And when I grew up, I found the same challenges. And by saying this, I'll give you a simple example. When you go to Uganda, you find that people with disabilities are still chained in the house, are still caged. This is still happening in the 21st century. And I really think we still have a huge gap and we still have a lot of work to do to change this. And uh, what made me change my perspective was, why do the same issues are still happening? So with dance, I came to realize that with dance, I can own, I can access through creating, through working, through interacting with different dancers. I can access my own democracy. I get voice through dance to even speak for those that really, that go through the unjust system, you know? And um, I came to realize that um, with all what that has been happening, I think the organizations that fight for people with disabilities and all the, the solutions we've been doing, we've been using wrong approach, approaches to, talk, to, to get to change these challenges. Why am I saying that? You will realize that for so many years, we've been coping and we've been influenced with the Western world. All these ideas we have in Africa countries, mostly in Uganda, these are ideas that we've coped from different countries. Not realizing that these, these ideas, these solutions are not Afrocentric at all. That's why the same challenges are still happening to my understanding. I'll give you a few examples for you to understand. Uh, for me, I think when it comes to mobility, then you're going to talk about good access, good, uh, good ramps, good roads, and how do you get from one place to another? But I think for me to get to that, you need to understand who are you doing it for? Which area are you doing it in? Because people with disabilities in Uganda have been crying for elevators, but in a country where we don't have stable electricity, you know, then this is not going even to work. They've been asking for ramps, uh, claiming to have ramps on certain buildings where, where they never go like they never go there but they want to have I'm, I'm not saying they shouldn't be there but i think we need to change the strategy of how we're going to because we really need to do to create impact not to just talk like how it has been done we've been asking for schools like for ed better education in a country where we don't have enough schools not even for those without disabilities you know people with disabilities yes they're complaining we don't we don't have we've got bursaries from certain schools but we don't have enough subsidies but the government that asking this is also benefiting from other government 
and I feel like as an artist, like I'll talk to my artist side that was just there to highlight other view. As an artist, um, the theaters, the funding, the grants are all in Europe because we don't have this in Uganda. In Uganda, we have one theater, like, and it's for musicians to let you know. And uh, everything that I need as an artist to create good work, to motivate people with disabilities is in Europe. But it is extremely agonizing to get a visa to come here as an artist. And you know, they, like, they keep creating all these options, but to get to those options, it's really hard. And, to me, it got me thinking like, no, we really need to do something as an artist. And I feel on my personal side that the more I get to create, the more I get to interact with and without people with disabilities, I feel I'm opening up minds of those that don't understand how bodies work, how bodies move. For example, the reason why I opened up um, these workshops and the reason why I feel inclusion is the way to go is every time I get people with disabilities come together with and without disability, you give them simple tasks. Yes, let's move from one place to another try to do a certain task, but find your own way. And at the end of the class, I've been collecting feedback and this feedback really makes you, helps you to understand the big gap we're having. Because in this feedback, you get things like, oh, I didn't know that actually they can move fast. I didn't think that you also fall in love, you know, because in this sharing, you have to understand the person you're working with. And when they go back to the communities, they go with a different perspective about, about disability. And I feel the more we need now, I feel with dance, now we need to create the need not to ask it. Because now, after interacting with someone with a disability or after spending time with someone with a different body, you know, unique body, you're, you're realizing the need you yourself. For example, I used to teach at, uh, we have an international school in Uganda, yes, for the rich, and uh, they used to invite me to teach dance. And at first, I wanted to ignore the offer because the school wasn't accessible. They have stairs, the, the studio is up. But then we have to twist according to the country we're living if we need change. I accepted the offer. But after three months, because there are times when I needed to teach in a wheelchair and they needed to lift me in a wheelchair, sometimes I made them lift me to show the need. And after a few months, they called me and they were like, we, we kindly ask you to come and uh, we, we want to make the school accessible because we want to be inviting more people with disabilities. So for me, if I refused the offer, the school would have stayed like that. But I created the need. I was close to them. They knew how important I am to them and to the children. And I also, to mention something before I forget it, it has come in my head. Um, reason why I work so much with children, I feel children are the next generations that are going to play a big role in changing this. When you're walking on street, children are very curious. When they see something they don't understand, they ask, which is a little bit with we grown-ups, when we see something we don't understand, we close out. Like, I don't understand and I don't want to know. But children, they ask, why are you doing that? But then we grown-ups, we have taken another step of even disabling the children. 
you see when you're walking on the street and the children ask their parents like, mom, look, why is he walking like that? Then immediately the parent will be like, shh, 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 then by doing this, you're putting a different, like a different image in the children. Like you're showing a disability is something that should be of shame. Like it's something of shame. Then how do you expect this child to associate with the people with disabilities in the, back in the local communities when you're doing that? You know, so I feel before we go to mobility, we need to go back down to the local communities where it starts from and see, yes, if we are to build or if we are to ease mobility in this area, who needs it? Have we educated people to go to, to the buildings to work with everyone? Or we just, we, we just going to, to keep putting pressure from, from the government, from whoever it is, we're just going to put pressure without showing them the need because I will say that in Africa, I feel everyone, I'm sorry to say, but I have to, in Africa, everyone is disabled. Because to me, disability is when you have a limitation to something, when you don't have access to something, when you're you're hindered into getting what you need at that time. And that's what, what is happening in Africa. So I feel before we ask huge step, because for example, we say, let's start with wheelchairs. But then before you ask for a fancy wheelchair, where are you going to use it from? Like, because we don't have even, when you look at the, lo the roads we have in, in Uganda, then it's also going to be a hard time for you. You're only going to use it in your house. Actually, we get organizations that give wheelchairs, but even people cannot use them in their houses, like in outside. They only use them in the houses. Then when they're walking, they have to crawl on. So I still feel if we are to talk about to see how best is this, we need to go back. And I feel with dance, it's giving us a huge opportunity to go down to the community because when you look at uh, a thousand years back in like Africa always used dance has um, Africa always used dance as a way to bring us all together to understand our cultures to understand everyone to appreciate your body so I feel dance is giving us a huge opportunity to understand your body, to understand yourself, to appreciate who you are, you know? And we're doing it through fun. So it's the best teaching. We are all dancing, we are having fun, and we are getting to understand each other. So I feel dance gives us a very huge opportunity. I beg to stop here. Time. <laughs> okay, thank you. That was a really sudden. Um, and but yeah, thank you very much um, for sharing your uh, perspective with us tonight here, and also to bring up the um, yeah the global um, aspect of our talk here um, up to the stage. Thank you. I hope we can have a longer conversation also about it, and also for the ones who are in Hamburg, Tibandike will have an will give a workshop on. Uh, Saturday, um, there you will probably get to know more about your artistic approach also, and uh, I think this is going to be really interesting, but I also hope that we are going to have a conversation afterwards. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> um, the next um, artist I want to introduce is Michael Turinsky. Maybe we can, we're not having you on screen yet. Ah, there you are. <laughs> Hello, Michael. Um, nice to have you here. Um, yeah, I will also briefly introduce you to the audience uh, in the room and also in the Zoom. Uh, Michael Turinsky is a choreographer, performer, philosopher, and theorist based in Vienna. 
In recent years, Michael has been a frequent guest at Kampnagel with his artistic works, as well as speaker at several panels. Some of you may remember his last production, Precarious Moves, for which he was awarded with this prestigious Swiss Nestroy Theatre Prize and Soiled, which premiered here at Kampnagel last October. In his artistic practice, Michael Turinsky explores the phenomenology of the body marked as disabled, its relationship to temporality and rhythm, to gender and sexuality, as well as to visibility and opacity. His works always develop in the field of tension between politics, aesthetics, and the particular discourses. To me, um, his works are almost arranged like performative essays. And um, I'm really excited uh, to have you here today and that you are giving an impulse um, from your perspective on mobility. Yeah. Thank you that you're here. Okay. Thank you a lot for the invitation and thank you for your kind introduction. Um, I would like to start with a little confession. Uh, mainly, I need to say that um, this time, it took me quite some time to figure out how to best contribute to our conversation because in fact it was in 2021 that I premiered my Maurice and Solo work, Precarious Moves, which was actually an about 70 minutes uh, performance all around questions of mobility and mobilization. So it seemed quite challenging for me to either condense my engagement with this topic into kind of 15 or 20 uh, minutes or to just pick out one aspect of this uh, engagement of this exploration of mobilization and mobility because what makes this uh, topic so intriguing and complex is in fact uh, the fact that as Mimi pointed out, it is a whole variety of uh, questions and problems on different scales that overlap or I'm there to say intersect on the field of mobility. Um, but in the end, I came to the conclusion that I want to put one particular question on the table, a question which seems to me of utmost importance uh, given our current ecological predicament, a question which I as a disabled choral author share also with my climate activist uh, brothers and sisters, which uh, at the moment have reached a certain kind of strategic impact. And this question can be basically formulated along the following lines. How can, how can we mobilize for different kinds of, for different forms of mobility? What does it mean to mobilize 
for different forms of mobility. And how can we as disabled carvers, um, how can we um, contribute in this process of uh, mobilizing for other forms of mobility, namely forms of mobility that are more trust, more inclusive, more sustainable, uh, more uh, ecological, less dominated by power relations. And um, now, as we all know, for such different forms of mobilities to gain momentum for those forms of mobility to gain prominence and significance in our society, a variety of political measurements need to be taken by our political leaders. Uh, so my those political measurements concern infrastructure transformations or taxes or legal constrictions. But on the other hand, we also know for sure that these political measurements will only be taken by our political leaders of governments, let's say, when there is already a certain degree of popular mobilization in place, or at least when the popular sentiments and popular, popular preferences already sum up to, to a certain degree of popular readiness for those political measurements uh, to be taken. So um, even if we agree on the fact that everything is a matter of political measurements, and I think it's very necessary to be very clear about this uh, necessity of political measurements and political frameworks, we are still confronted with the challenge of popular mobilization. We are still confronted, as I might put it, with the challenge of preparing the popular ground. Let's do, let me put it like this. Um, so now when it comes to this challenge of popular mobilization of preparing popular ground, so to speak, it is certainly a whole variety of strategies that we need to employ. And definitely what we need to practice is a kind of critical solidarity towards each other and between us as we engage in those various strategies. Um, so, for example, let me make this little reference to the discussions here in Austria about the people from the last 
generation, how can we um, stay with them or be in solidarity with them and still be able to articulate a certain critical stance towards their uh, kind of strategy. But still, what can we do as artists? And what can we do as a um, as, um, disabled corpus in this role set of, uh, of um, mobilizing for different, namely more just, more sustainable, more inclusive mobilities. And so what I would like to propose here might seem a little bit surprising, um, but nonetheless, I would like to propose that what we can do as disabled artists is to open up a space in which we not only engage with our common desire to move and with our common pleasure in movement, I feel that we can open up a space in which our deepest, in which our deepest passionate attachments to dominant forms of mobility can be worked through, elaborated on, and maybe even partially dissolved. So what I would like to point out um, is that According to my perspective, what glues us to these dominant forms of mobility, what attaches us to those dominant forms of mobility is much more complex and multi layered than, for example, behaviorist psychologists might search as. So I recently, I have to tell you this, I recently listened to a so-called traffic psychologist speaking before I did I didn't even know that there is something like a traffic psychologist. Very interesting profession actually. Um and what is um uh, uh, what is traffic psychologist suggested was that for example um that what he pointed is what he pointed out was like we learned for example we learned to enjoy going with hundred with hundred thirty on the street. We learned to to enjoy going fast without car and so it would be only a matter of unlearning this enjoyment of driving fast and just learning to enjoy to go by hundred, you know? And so according to her, it was just a matter of behavioral habituation. And I have to say, that I don't buy into this behaviorist um, way of framing 
the problems because I feel that these attachments to certain forms of mobility are actually, as I said, much more complex and much more multi layered. And um, and so what we have to say, what Carlos can do is to unpack, to unpack all those layers of our attachment to certain forms of mobility and work with them, elaborate on them, on them play with them, and maybe also change the form. And, um, yeah, let me just um, add one thing before I continue in my little paper. I think that for us as dancers and choreographers, it is also The challenge we need to face today, I feel, is how can we keep internationalism? How can we keep um, international productions um, still happening? Because this is what we definitely need. We need to cross borders in our artistic and daily lives. That's super important for various reasons. But then also, how can we uh, negotiate our commitment to international production or residency practices and so on? How can we um, negotiate this with the urgent need uh, to change um, um, our systems of production and distribution according to the ecological urges and the ecological predicament that we are currently facing. So this is something very complicated and interesting for me. How can we keep this uh, practice of crossing borders um, in our artistic work and still in, um, commit ourselves to ecologically changing our practices of production distribution. And let me continue now in my in my paper. Um, I said that we can um, unpack the different layers of our attachment to certain of mobility and uh, elaborate on them and work them through. And I think this, um, what I would like to say is that this not only um, entails a certain kind of mourning uh, in the sense of mourning certain forms of mobility that have proven to, uh, to, to not respect um, personal and ecological limits. Um, it not only entails the work of mourning, but rather, I would say, and even more, our choreographic practice is also a work of adaptation. So what do we do? 
What do we do? It's to open up a space in which we adapt the forms of mobility that we feel attached to in such a way that we change the form of that mobility while still keeping the essential, essential ingredient of pleasure, of pleasure that we attach to it. And with changing the form, I mean, for example, changing, changing aspects like pace, rhythm, relation to space, and so on and so on. That this process of like, um, how do you, uh, like, go from A to B in your way, in the way that works for you, and the way it feels good and is pleasurable for you. Um, um, so basically what I want to point out is that, um, that, that, um, that what do we do with these forms of mobility that we find ourselves attached to is a kind of head of mystic, a mystic transformation, okay? Um, so, and it is precisely this, let's say, head on mystic twist in which we also invite our audiences. So we not only invite our audiences in the process of molding certain forms of mobility that have proven to disrespect our personal as well as ecological limits, we also invite them in a radically alternative hedonism of movement. So basically this, I would say, is our modality of mobilizing for different forms of mobility, engaging our audiences in the hedonistic twist of moving differently. And I think that this is precisely our expertise because whether personal or ecological we we know how to respect and acknowledge limits and at the same time move through life with great pleasure and the thing is precisely our resource of mobilizing for different ways of moving. And with this, I um, stop my presentation and uh, open up the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, dear Michael, for your thoughts. Um, yeah, I really like how all of your three um, impulses already in my mind, at least, like dialogue with each other. I think Tivan Deke, what you have just brought up, and Michael, um, in both of your talks, um, you reject the kind of one solution fits all model of mobilities and really um, speak about using dance as a space to um, actually um, 
go deeply into the fabric of movement and really look at uh, reality and a specific local context or community context and not um, yeah look at uh, these things from a dominant or like more superficial perspective but really use dance as the space that can be a lab laboratory of these questions um, very concretely um, I don't know I have the impulse to ask you three first of all a question to the tech team can we have Mimi and Michael both on the screen here that would be amazing for the talk situation and I was wondering if um, the three of you had any comments or disagreements or questions to each other um, then I would like to give the stage to that first of all um, yeah I will let you think about this uh, for a moment and also the question goes to our audience here in the room of course if you want to comment on anything have thoughts questions you're welcome make one yeah. comment um i i just want to say i i so appreciated the way both um Tibandeke and michael looked towards uh transformative uh impulses and and where will change come from and and how and whether it's children and kind of beginning with that sense of curiosity or um, Mikhail's sense of, of hedonism and, and pleasure. I mean, you both gave us this incredible sense of kind of joy and pleasure in discovering moving in different ways. And I, I just really appreciate that. I love that. Um, if I can just add something, I always love to use examples I've, I've learned and I've got from the things I do, because they inspire me to keep creating. I have a son, and he's three years old. And uh, one time he asked me that, uh, why do you use that? And I explained that, oh, well, I got sick, I have a condition called polio, but I always just do think I'm doing the right thing. He will never understand he's young. But uh, something really like amazed me. We went to a cafe in Uganda, where, like everyone was doing their own stuff. And there came someone with the disabilities. He was using crutches and uh, he was close to us. And the person was trying to stand and my son stood up quickly he ran and he grabbed his crutch and is like, no, you will need this. And I was like, oh, actually they learn from what we're telling them, however small they are. So he knew if always my father needs this to stand up, then I see you with the same crutch then. Actually, I think I can even help you when you're standing. So this really touched me a lot and I would love to leave this. The small things we do that really create a huge impact. And I'm sure whoever this guy was, he had a different, he had a beautiful day. I'm very sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry, um, Tevan Dicke, we didn't uh, manage to set up the screen so you can see both of uh, our digitally present speakers, but it uh, looks mm -hmm. good for now. It just makes dialoguing a little bit easier if we can see all of us. <laughs> just give you a moment. I, I, I think that makes me, that makes me think that um, um, when we do coffee or when we, um, you know, when we each when we, in one way or another, invite people into our practice. Um, yeah, it's not only, as I said, it's not only a matter of care, ah, it's not only a matter of pleasure, it's also a way of um, 
of um, engaging people into care and um, teaching people um, context sensitive practice of uh, taking care because in in dance as you know we not only have to do with abstract principles we always you will very concrete physical situations and I think that um, in this sense um, uh, we also engage people in a practice of situation specific care and the talk of so this is a, a very nice um, mixture about uh, choreographic practice. Because on the one hand, it is only sick, but on the other hand, it's also a practice of, of care. Um. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly important um, aspect to bring up. I I was wondering, um, because you also spoke about uh, critical uh, solidarity, and um, I, I hear that also as like solidarity amongst uh, disabled artists to work together and lead this process that you described, Michael, um, in dance, working through our attachment um, to dominant mobility um, or dominant ways of mobility that we got used to, that we had ha habits of turning to. And um, uh, it, it just made me think of um, something Pelina Kika Brown, a disabled choreographer who was here in residency recently, uh, directly in this hall, was bringing up in another talk um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, about uh, typing on a keyboard as a choreographic practice and she brought up questions of the smallest movement possible or moving without movement and um, yeah I think to me that resonated a lot with uh, you um, speaking of a dance and or of disabled choreographers working through these um, habits and really understanding um, this construction of these really reduced ideas of mobility and hegemonic, hegemonic set of possible or available uh, movements through space. Um, so my question to you would be, as disabled artists, how could you work um, leading this process? How could you be in solidarity with each other? And what spaces would you need for that? Um, because often there, these processes are not yet institutionally or politically very supported, as you also said in your talk. Um, you need uh, political mobilization um, for these spaces to even exist. Um, maybe a second question from my perspective would also be how dance institutions or dance critics or non-disabled choreographers could also support this labor. Um. Um, I'm not sure if I got your question, I understood it right. I mean, when I talked about critical solidarity, I was actually mainly business with LPD. <laughs> I was mainly busy with uh, with a, with a discussions among climate activists at the moment and the political challenges that the, that the climate movement currently faces and the necessity of a, of a practicing critical solidarity between them and among them. So I was actually mainly busy with this when I talked about um, when I talked about critical solidarity. And um, yeah, when it comes to 
working together as disabled artists. Um, I mean, I think I have to say that I speak from a very privileged uh, position. Um, and it's, um, it's even a bit hard for me to tell you which kind of changes I need for my work because I actually quite feel okay uh, with the conditions that I find. Uh, so I'm pretty happy, uh, more or less happy with, with my with my profession. But as I say, I'm speaking from very privileged uh, um, with issues. But I think that for me, what is really like, um, I can say something very personal. I have to say that our, our efforts of contributing something or our efforts to do our best to make things better, let's put it like this. Those efforts are not always um, are not always as appreciated as uh, I would like uh, them. Uh, to be appreciated. So, um, but this is again, this is again an artist dilemma that you need to face. That sometimes people like what you do, and sometimes they don't like so much what you do. And this is maybe, this is maybe, um, our artist's fate, so to speak. Um, but what I feel is that we need to open up spaces in which also our efforts of repair are appreciated. Because when we come together as disabled and non-disabled people, and as um, as differently situated people, hurt, hurt can happen. Okay, but how can we practice um, appreciating our efforts of repair? Because this is the basis of solidarity, of critical solidarity. I think that we, that we have spaces, not only safe spaces in which we are so safe that we never hurt each other, but how can we open up spaces in which we can be free and also can trust in our ability to repair and to contribute. So this is, I think, my, my deep, sometimes I feel that even my deepest longing to experience um, spaces in which um, Efforts of contribution and efforts of repair are appreciated because, yeah, yeah, I want to say something very short. Me, as a disabled person, I make the experience that when I move, I can easily crash. Things. For example, when I reach out for a glass, 
and I can crash it easily. And that's my basic ecological sensibility. Let me look it like that. The ecological sensibility is okay. When I move, I can really crash things. And so I'm very interested in opening up spaces also in which kind of repair is appreciated and we can successfully happen. But that, that was a long, uh, a long response. Yeah. Do you want to say I just want, yes, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, for me, you'll excuse me if I'm always have different perspective, I see things. Uh, but thinking of solidarity, um, I think before we come to that, I think as people with disabilities, we need to deeply accept this is who we are. Because it's my role to teach everyone around me who I am and to make ever not it's not a must to make them like who I, but there is no way I'm going to do that when I've not accepted and appreciate. Um, because for me, I believe the reason why people look at me when I'm walking or people look at my body structure, it's because I'm speaking a different language. When I'm doing it, when I'm moving, my body's speaking a language they don't understand. Because for example, maybe for the, what we consider to be a normal person, it's just this movement. And mine is connected movement. So before I understand it, if I myself, then there's no way how I'm going to make people around me accept it. So which will even make it more harder if we, it's very beautiful to work together as a group, but then it will even make it harder if we don't accept who we really are from inside and not to waste time. I also think something that is important. I feel this is my personal view as people with disabilities, we have to remove this sense of preciousness around disability. We need to allow people to talk about it outside there so that they can understand. Because I've come to notice in my perspective that people even fear to talk about disability. Then how do you expect if they're in there, any office they're working in, how do you expect them to change or to modify for you when they don't even understand what they're modifying. Yes, it's their responsibility to educate themselves, but we have a big role to play in this. So I feel that the more we keep it this precious, that people find it precious, then that's why people are distancing it. I mean, so, and when you look at uh, back in the years in Africa, they have a saying that people with disabilities, it was a gift from the gods because when you find these people with disabilities, they were either very smart for a certain thing in a certain particular area, they were the healers, they were the fortune tellers because they were gifted in a way. And with this capitalism that was flushed out and so the more we keep it precious, I think the more people are distancing it and then we will just be repeating, repeating the same thing. Like we'll be just keeping on, things are not working, people with disabilities need this, but there are some chains we need to break as people with disabilities. Yeah, thank you. Thing to say? <laughs> I didn't want to add something to this. I. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I, maybe I wanted to ask 
if there are any questions in our audience or in our Zoom chat already. Um, I know it's already quite late, um, but no, no, it's not because of you, Tivanti. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a question, yeah. We don't have a microphone, right? You can just pass on my microphone. I can use mine. I don't really have a question, um, or maybe it's a question to everybody, because <clears throat> what I experience is that people who are considered normal are more disabled than the people who are who have um, worked with themselves who are called bodily disabled. So I think it would be a good idea to bring um, a movement form into schools, which is called mobility, call it dance or mobility with music or just mobility, so that movement can be without competition. Like in sports, it's very often very competitive. And um, so it would be a good idea to bring mobility to, to the children, to the kindergartens, and then the people who have explored themselves like you you did, you too, you are the able person or people who can then teach people to move without competition and without um, and uh, with accepting what I can do, because there are so many people who have disabilities, which we call disabilities because of diff mentally or sexually or whatever so um in my in my world there are either is everybody disabled or there's or everybody is abled in a certain perspective so yeah uh, i have another comment in the audience and maybe then the podium can react to both of them um, hi, my name is Corinne. I also came from Vienna. Hi, Michael. <laughs> and um, well, I think um, what you said, um, Joseph, about accepting yourself, and um, I think it's a, it's an important part. I I uh, agree, and um, and I see the ch that that the, the way people look at you or at Michael or at other disabled artists or people on the that are um, I also have a disabled child so I know what it feels like as a mother so and I also see what the role because you said that the role of the disabled person that they actually make that they are in a way the people who are make the other people think about themselves but you have to think of yourself also first yeah i think it's a challenge of course yeah and um not everybody can do that for themselves but what we what i see is how you can change our perspective on our ourself in a way the way you said that you feel disabled or that who is disabled what is this question about yeah so um and i think opening up and and as artists you have the possibility to change the perspective as we all as artists change perspectives yeah and you ch change also the perspective of people who look at people who are with disability but also on their own way of you know shortcomings so this can open up a total different uh, view on how we look at people all over and how we um actually empower ourselves and empower each other through that so i think it's great that you're on stage both of you thank you very much that you made that effort for it and keep going um thank you corinne for that i i always get this question from people with disabilities that uh sometimes when when they look at me i even stop moving i get nervous like what are they looking at that i don't see myself and i always tell them because i always tell them that your body is constantly performing just continue performing because they are 
the uh, lo looking at the performance. Now, f I've like, for example, to make you understand, if we all had no clothes and one person had clothes, that person would feel uncomfortable. And uh, if we all like, if that person also didn't have clothes, then it would be something very normal. So if now when through stopping, through stopping that, then you're also showing them that you're doing something wrong, let them learn, give them time to enjoy. And uh, just to say something that uh, to bring this in schools, I feel this is a very beautiful thing to do, me too. And uh, that pushed me to come up with the research I was doing, to come up with a workshop I do, The Forgotten Ones. Because uh, when you look at uh, the dancing, these things have been done somewhere. But uh, when you look at the dancing schools, puts, they've created limits. Yes, it's good to learn techniques and to come with all these ballet and uh, all these our traditional dances, but they've also created limits to us. Because when you look at this, I'll use ballet because everyone knows it here. When you look at it, uh, it has rule like strict rules. You have to be at a certain height. You need to dance in a certain way. And we are different. Not everyone is going to do that. So through doing that, now we are putting a different, we are building some mentality in these kids, you know. And uh, I feel like now dance also needs to be decolonized to a language that everyone can understand. And if it's not done, then it's your responsibility to find your own dance in you. Because the more I keep dancing, I feel, the more it connects me actually back to my roots. Because these movements, I've not learned them from somewhere, but I've inherited them, you know? They just, they just don't come out of the blue. Yes, it's good, don't get me in the wrong way. It's good to learn a technique, but also to give yourself time to discover what's inside you. Thank you. I'm so happy you're bringing this up, uh, Tipandika. I know we are short of time. I think we um, started a bit late, so I want to give our panel five minutes to finish this discussion. But actually, this was an urgent question I had for you about um, a kind of maybe forced mobility in the sector of dance in order to um, achieve uh, certain resources, platforms, visibility, and also, as you say, like technical education in some sense. Um, that forces transnational artists like you to just like, yeah, um, um, just always move around the globe. And also, I know that f from your workshop, you work a lot in your practice um, uh, as in connection to ancestors and um, that the question of how to stay rooted while a lot of your um, structural support is built in like the so-called global north or other parts of the globe that are like colonial um, powers. Um, um, yeah, like how can you, um, despite that mobility that maybe you didn't even choose, um, stay connected to your own practice? And um, do you need to protect your practice actually from the influences, uh, the dominant influences of that mobility. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on it briefly and maybe we can have a final question also for Mimi and then close the round. Yeah, I'll just, nice. I'll just say something very, very, very quickly. Um, it's not a sense of like keeping it like, uh, um, like, uh, what, what, what should I use? It's not about owning it, like keeping my heritage. No, it's good to come to other technique. For example, the, uh, I always attend classes for people without disabilities. I've always, I always apply in different schools that don't do disability classes in a sense that it gives me opportunity actually to understand how you move and what are my limitations in this movement. And uh, through understanding that, 
the next the next time I'm in a studio, actually I'm very aware and accepting of how I appreciate the movement that me coming from here to that. I appreciate the mo how I do the movement. And uh, as I said, like through this, I own my, I own my voice, my own democracy. And I feel like the more I understand my movement, now I get to appreciate where it's coming from, which takes me back to, to my roots. And, uh, but I shouldn't, I feel I shouldn't also protect it from others. I need to open it to everyone and so that it's it's for everyone to also to get to to share this moment with me because through sharing this moment then they get to understand my body language yes hope i've answered you thank you yeah then maybe i'm having a question for you mimi um because uh, michael brought up the pro problem of needing um to popularize um forms of mobility and uh, using dance to understand and deconstruct our emotional attachments to dominant movement styles and i was wondering if you have a yeah an idea of what uh, mobility studies on their side um, can do to contribute to more mobility justice and a more diverse approach to mobility in a larger um, society and how have political and funding relation, relations have changed um, through the repositioning of the field itself because um, in the beginning I think mobility studies were really strongly connected um, to technical and economical global contexts and um, that I think has changed a lot, right? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, there, I, I, first, I just want to, before I get to the la last part, the, the beginning part, I think it connects to what both of um, the other panelists have said, which is the concept that I use, which I call mobile commoning. Um, commoning being an act that's about sharing and limitations and caring. So I speak of commoning as a kind of caring mobilities and a sharing mobilities. And that connects so well, both with this idea um, of uh, something being one's own democracy, but a democracy that is a shared commoning, but also um, as Mikhail said, the critical solidarity and, and where does how do we build critical solidarity? Well, we build it through mobile commoning and commoning uh, requires us to understand um, our limits, both both our internal limitations and explore our ways of moving, but also to, um, as you say, be more just and inclusive and sustainable and ecological and question power relations as we move and be aware of the things we break, right, if we move without care. And that's for all of us in the world and how we how we all move in the world. We all need to do that now. Um, so I think that says something too. then to the final part about this field of mobilities is that it it um, it is now there's a whole field of mobility humanities and mobility and arts, mobilities and design, mobilities and architecture. I mean, every field it's touched upon, um, it kind of tries to bring these questions of our relations, solidarity, justice, um, and commoning sustainability into the, the question um, in all these different ways. And I think this has been a really exciting and productive conversation for giving um, more new ways to think about that. So thank you. Thank you a lot. Um, these are perfect closing words. I want to just take the opportunity to thank Teban Deke, Michael and Mimi from all my heart. And I think I can speak for Luisa and Melanie as well for accepting this invitation. I really loved um, yeah, the different perspectives you've all shared with us today from practice, choreography, dance and uh, science and research. 
Um, I just want to quickly announce the rest of the focuses program, but really briefly. Please, please come see Diana Niebse's show, um, Uatru Lado da Danza, which we show, uh, premiering tomorrow three times in K1. Um, Saidu Leilu's premiere is on Friday. It's an amazing work with a huge crew of dancers on stage, amongst them 15 local dancers from Hamburg. We have the gym going on uh, in the K4. They offer a five-day program with a lot of really um, great workshops and mental workouts. And Nicolas Faubert is also with us in residency and doing a work in progress on Sunday. So please, uh, you're all invited to join this program. I also want to just draw your attention to a call for donations for the victims of the earthquakes um, that will be collected at the door. Um, we, I have all the information who the money goes to. Um, directly to people in Syria, we are directly connected through some of our staff members and it will pass on personally. We also have some um, other organizations that we donate to and NGOs on our website. And here in Hamburg, we give directly to Hamburg, um, at Der Hafen hilft. Um, so please find all the details on our website and we appreciate everything you can do to support us in that. Thank you so much for your attention and time tonight. And yeah, I would close this round and wish you all a very nice evening.